Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, YouTube. Hello, art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M. And I'm back with yet another video. Uh, today, uh, what are we going to do today? Uh, well, like I promised last time, uh, like I said, now I'm at the end of these videos. I think I'm going to just tack on at the end, like, you know, on the next episode or next video or whatever. So what did I say in this last one about Eyes Wide Shut Part 3? What, what, and I changed the title like a couple times. Why did Stanley Kubrick choose a book? Uh, I think the rest of it is, uh, why did why did Stanley Kubrick choose a book about sex and hoes? I said I was going to talk about the CIA um, PSYOP thing. Like, this was modern art, really, a CIA PSYOP. Okay, and I'm doing that. This might be a two-parter. I don't know. So, like, I, I just, I've decided to tell you right away what the video is going to be about when I start. So you can make the decision of whether or not to click off or, or remain uh, and listen to the video. Uh, so that's what it's going to be about. I'm going to go through some articles. Okay. I've got six of them lined up, but I might have to do like three in one video and three in the next. Because it's a lot of information. And a lot to think about, not just a lot of information. It's not, sometimes it's not about the amount of information. It's about like the, all that thinking you have to do. Um, maybe, you know, like a song lyric. That's not a lot of information. That's a song lyric is, is brief, right? But oh, the thinking. Oh, the thinking you do. Um, when you do a song lyric, like sometimes I put, you know, when I put a song up in here, in the um, community tab and I can't find like when's the last time I did that but it can't be that long ago um, and uh, yes I will be providing more grocery store picks I just you know when I'm there I, I, I'm so busy um, buying my damn groceries that I sometimes forget but next time I'll, I'll like I'll show you the candy aisle or something um, or like the baked goods or so I don't know uh, or maybe the coffee of course. Why Why didn't I think of that right away? But here's the last song that I put, and it was on Halloween. Uh, it was thanks to thanks to Richard, Tank of the Tales, and his adorable little family. The babies are too, too cute. Uh, Every Day is Halloween by Ministry. Yeah, Ministry. And, like, I know you might not take Ministry too seriously. You might think it's just like a party uh, band or just about sex, drugs, and rock and roll or whatever. No, take a look. Take, take a better look at Al Jorgensen. Take a better look at his biography. Um, take a better look at his songs. Even something like this one. Every day is Halloween. I think this is from the early eighties. Um, you know, Al Jorgensen was no, is, well, is, is no dummy. Um, he actually went to college. He actually, I, I looked up his biography, he went to the University of Chicago, all right? So, like, this guy is, is a serious um, person. Uh, oh, that, yeah. Was, was, I'm looking for another song. When I put up songs, I don't want you to just think of, you know, just enjoy the song. Oh, no, that's not what we do here. We don't just enjoy things. No, we have to think about them. Um, so those lyrics are important. God M by Alice in Chains. Oh, listen to that one. Check out the lyrics for that one. It's amazing. And the reason I put that one is because of the Oppenheimer quote where from the Bhagavad Gita, he said, I am, I am become death destroyer of worlds. So basically he thought of himself as a freaking God. You know, that's why I put God M and I've been, I've been, this has been on repeat quite often for me lately when I'm working out, when I'm driving around, you know. Um, but yeah, so uh, just because there's not a lot of information sometimes doesn't mean that there's not a lot to think about. And today I'm going to probably read you a couple of articles about this, this here, this, this topic. And I don't know how I'm going to, I'm not going to try and frame it, period. Like when, um, you know, now that's a common thing to say, framing something, framing an argument, framing a, a discussion or, or whatever. That comes to us from like, I believe, like when that really, really became 
um, you know, like a common thing to say, framing something. It was like the late early 80s, uh, late, no, no, late, late 90s, late 90s. I'm sorry, I can't talk today. I had a long ass day. Uh, late 90s, early 2000s, like this, this, and framing, it was uh, discussed as far as far as like something that uh, was done or was necessary to do in political discourse, framing a debate. Okay, so I'm not going to frame a damn thing. I'm that because to me, when somebody says I'm going to frame something, or you know, that means that they're trying to deceive you. Okay, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to pr present you with some good ass articles that you know that that provide some information and then you can do what you want with that information in, in your own mind intellectually or emotionally or spiritually or however you want to process it um but this thing was modern art really a cia psyop and like i said this is from jstor daily i have another article from artnet news how uh moma the museum of, museum of modern art and the cia conspired to use unwitting artists to promote american propaganda during the cold war all right and then the third one i think i'll do today is like from the horse's mouth uh the horse herself francis I think it's a lady, Frances Stoner. Saunders, modern art was CIA weapon, and she's the one who wrote the book, all right, the book that all of this is based on, uh, who paid the Pied Piper. Uh, in the U.S., the title is The Cultural Cold War. Okay, now the, the, her, her Wikipedia for the book and uh, the New York Times book review thing and and the first chapter of the book itself called exquisite corpse i think i will read those to you next time in part two it's gonna this is part one of two i've decided i've decided because this is a lot to think about now why why did i um decide to do a video and now two videos about this subject because i've been seeing it lately like everywhere like on social media especially you know twitter former Twitter, current X. I saw like, um, one of those people, hold on, let me actually find it for you just uh, to, um, so you know what I'm talking about. Hold on. Okay. You guys, this is it. This is, this is where I've been seeing this, um, social media. When I said social media, I meant Twitter. Now look at this. This is, um, this is a, uh, a Twitter X account called Culture Critic. Now, Culture Critic is very, very, very um, critical, I guess, uh, appropriately so, critical <laughs> of the, like, anything to do with modern art or contemporary art. And they just, you know, um, let me actually just show you Cultural Critic's, like, um, thing. This is apparently a very very popular account on twitter i am subscribed to it not like subscribe subscribe but like i i, I follow this account like i'm not gonna pay um no i'm not at that point yet in my life where i can just throw money out the window on um subscribing to somebody's twitter feed but <laughs> I, uh, yeah, that's why, I mean, I'm very critical and I'm very suspicious of stuff like this. Like, subscribe? Why? Why should I subscribe? Like, mm. but, um, this is cultural crit Culture Critics' uh, Twitter page. Tradition is not the, this is their bio, I guess. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. What in the blue fuck does that mean? I don't know if I like the sound of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, they burn books and fires. <laughs> Book burning is, has been around for quite some time and I don't like it at all. <laughs> um, but that's the first thing I think of when I, when I read this line. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. I had to look that up. Where'd that come from? But okay, they put it on their bio. And they have, oh, for God's sake, look at this. Their, their, um, their, their profile pic is, is the head of Michelangelo's David. Oh, oh, for goodness sake. I, I didn't know I would laugh like this, but here we are. I'm, I, I'm, I'm having a good chuckle. 
over this. But cultural critic puts up this kind of stuff, and it's usually quite inflammatory. It seems to be designed in order to um, evoke some kind of reaction from the from the viewer, the reader, whatever we are. Um, and of course, they say rem a reminder that modern art, modern art. Excuse me, I can't enunciate or pronunciate today. You're going to have to forgive me. Uh, reminder that modern art was a CIA psyop. Oh, okay. Former CIA officials came clean on this during the 90s. I'm going to say allegedly. You know, you know I'm reading this off of Culture Critics um, post on X, Twitter, whatever. Um, but allegedly former CIA officials came clean on this during the 90s confirming that the agency used abstract art by Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and others to promote American culture during the Cold War. Now, this Cold War, this is, this is, um, you know, we still don't know what really, like, let's be honest with ourselves. We don't really know what the hell was going on during the world, um, during the Cold War, and we probably never will. But, um, you know, I think Stanley had something to say about that we just have to like be able to figure out what he was saying in his movies the intent was here it goes it continues the intent was to portray america as a bastion of intellectual and creative freedom uh, this was to rebut soviet assertions that the u.s was culturally barren and to contrast the con the cultural confinement of the Soviet Empire, where artists had been restricted to painting Soviet realism since the 1930s. Okay. And they, they, they focus on abstract expressionism. Now, where did Culture Critic get all of this? Well, in their post that follows this initial one, there's a picture with a, I guess, a link. I can't do that on Twitter, but then again, I'm not blue checked. Um, so whatever. Um, and you, if you click on this darn thing, it comes up with the same article that I found when I Googled the topic. So, I mean, is culture critic, what is culture critic doing? I mean, this is not, you know, I'm not going to criticize culture critic that much. You know, this is a content creator and what have you, but like, is culture critic just lifting from other people's work? The, in this case, uh, the person who wrote the book in, in, um, I think it was the 90s. This article is dated back to 1995. Francis Stoner Saunders. Okay. Um, and let me pause one more time. Hold on. This is my, um, this is my Instagram account. So please, you know, if you want to, please feel free to follow me on, uh, the former Twitter uh, and or the current Instagram and I've been showing like on Instagram I've been putting up a lot of these abstract expressionist works lately um I just don't know why I just felt you know I like I told you sometimes I do things just based on my gut all right just based on my gut um not really knowing why I'm doing it like I've been seeing abstract expressionism in the news and on social media a lot lately and I say Hmm, what is, what in the world is a goings on? Okay, so I just, I just decided to put a lot of these. I'm going to change my um, social media, my, my Twitter and my Instagram strategies. But, you know, I think I've been doing it all wrong. But I, I'm still glad that I put up all these artworks. Not a lot of likes for these artworks. Not at all. And how many did I get today? Okay, I put a picture of crucified Jesus and this thing today. Uh, the allegorical conclusion of the Christological cycle, the bird and the snake by Inde, uh, date circa 975. Uh, you know, and this got more likes than any of the abstract expressionist things I put up. So I don't know if that's an indication of anything. But hold up. Let me, let me continue with my original uh, thing here. So that's what we're going to talk about today. It took me almost 15 minutes to tell you. That's what we're going to talk about today. And the modern art thing, the thing that's in the news a lot. And people take this as, you know, w whether it's um, Frances Stoner Saunders' book, and then all these subsequent articles. I think that she is the 
um, Frances so oh yeah, yeah, uh, just, I'll just call her Saunders. Saunders, I believe she is the uh, kind of locus of all this stuff regarding the CIA and modern art as a whip, and, um, or just you know a part of a psyop. That's how what I've been able to figure out so far. Okay. Uh, I could be wrong. It, it, you know, maybe it wasn't her book or her research that started all of this and got like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of conspiracy theorists, uh, tongues to wagging. I don't know. I don't know, but this is what I, this, I think I'm, this is where I'm at now. I, I might dig a little deeper. I don't know. Get my shovel, get my pickaxe or, you know, like the, an excavator. Who, who the hell knows? But that's what we're going to do. If you haven't already, now would be the time to fire up the percolator, y'all. Fire up that percolator. Go into the kitchen, fill it up with water, put the grounds in, plug the thing in, and, and hit the switch. And, and let's go. It's because it's time. It's coffee time. Okay, this is, I think I'm going to do a coffee break. This is going to be a coffee break. We're just having some coffee. And then next time we'll have a, you know, for this thing, part two of this subject. So plenty of opportunity to drink coffee. Of course, I'm going to have some during my own coffee breaks for this while I record this because I'm it's story time, y'all. We're going to be reading. Uh, and I'm going to put all of these articles in the description, even though I'm only going to cover three of them in this video and the second three in the next video, just if you want to read them as, as like, you know, homework um, <laughs> to prepare for the next video. But um, yeah, fire up that percolator. Get your coffee. Get get all the stuff, your cream, sugar, your donuts, your cookies, whatever you enjoy having with it. Y'all, uh, it's time. It's time. Um, before I go off on any tangents, I'm going to do my intro, my uh, church announcements, as I call them. So yeah, fire up that percolator. Get your pumpkin spice coffee, pumpkin spice creamer, pumpkin spice um, oof, sugar, <laughs> or pumpkin spice cookies. All right, because it's time. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing. I appreciate every single last one of you. Now there are 929 of you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Uh, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video, this video, or any other one of my videos. If you know somebody who might enjoy my particular brand of nonsense, uh and especially with with uh, extra emphasis on liking and hit that notification bell while you're at it you know it's right right under the video you can go ahead and hit my notification bell and you will be notified every time i drop one of these monstrosities of mine um <laughs> we can have coffee you know virtually um pretend coffee uh or you know you can have your coffee there and just listen to my nonsense um you know, and you'll be notified every single time I drop one of these monster videos of mine. So there's that, you guys. There is that. Um, I said I was going to go off on a tangent. And I, I, I yes, I, I, I had a nice day today. A busy day, but a nice day. Had an evaluation at work. It was marvelous. So I'm, I'm in a good mood. I'm a, am I in a good, 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 good mood. But it's coffee time. All right, get your pumpkin spice, get your, get all the stuff together. Um, we're gonna talk about this because it warrants talking about. And like I said, uh, I've been I've been showing you a variety of art and art images in my community tab lately. Uh, I think I've been going about it all wrong. This one is particularly appetizing. What is this one called? New York Deli Sweets. I want them all. I want them all. I want this chocolate cake in the middle. I want this, what is this, black forest cake over here to the right. This cheesecake on the left. These uh, key lime squares. Looks like some, some brownies with some pretzels on them. Um, oh my goodness, I could eat all of these. And I said I'm not big on sweets, but for some reason this painting makes me want to eat all of these. And these little ones down here, the tarts. Oh yes. Oh, wait, so I've been showing you a variety of art. All available for purchase on Amazon. This is not a video that's sponsored, but I am an Amazon associate. Um, and 
the fun for me with regard to that is looking through all of the stuff on Amazon that, you know, in the fine arts section. Yes, Amazon does have a fine arts section. They have plenty of paintings, oil paintings, watercolor paintings, uh, pen and ink, charcoal drawings, um, you know, pastel, stuff like that. All different media, prints, you name it. And they're for sale and they're affordable. So I'm just showing you, I'm curating my little feed here to, sh you know, things that I find interesting visually for a bunch of different reasons. Not Maybe I don't even think that it's beautiful, but, you know, that's just the kind of person I am. I think an image is good or, or you know, worth looking at just because it makes me think of things. This one, bench, you know, $90. Oh, no, it's not $90. It's probably $900. But um, it's just a bench next to a big ass tree. Isn't that something? Um, and of course the pumpkin spice horror. Now this one, a rose is a rose. This one is playing with the idea from Magritte, like the treachery of images. There ain't no rose in this picture. There's an eggplant, shallot, and a couple of, no, three cherries. And this eggplant is in this cup. What in the world was this artist thinking? But it's still an interesting painting. These apples and the teapot and this little jar lunch set for three. I don't see no lunch. I see some apples, but whatever. Um, the burning bush, like I said, biblical stuff I've been doing lately. Uh, winter in Soho, uh, Eve on the river, the latest, uh, I, I already showed you this one in the other video. This is Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah from drawings from the Bible. And I think the same artist, uh, Hagar in the desert from drawings from the Bible. Now, why am I showing you all of these different things in the community tab? <clears throat> because I want you to start looking at art, okay? If I, I mean, if I were your professor, if I were your professor, don't worry, there's not going to be an exam. Don't worry, there's no homework. There's no assigned reading. Absolutely not. All you have to do is listen to me. But if I was your professor, like, you know, I I wouldn't want to just have you think what I think. I have you just regurgitate my opinion back to me or in the blue book. Not that they use those anymore, no. But like, you know, back in, if you're a certain age, you know what a blue book is. Um, <laughs> and like, we don't, I, I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that that's really an education. That's, that's, you know, I might as well be Sergeant Hartman if I'm going to do something like that. And, you know, Sergeant Hartman is effective. He's just doing his job. But that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to hopefully inspire you to have your own thoughts of whatever kind that you want. Um, what is going on with this issue? With this modern art issue? Modern art is it's controversial. It is extremely controversial. People have something to say about this stuff. This And now modern art, you know, it says modern art. When they use the word modern art, Okay, um, as far as like the, the taxonomy of art and art history, um, the categorization of stuff like time periods, genres, and, you know, movements and whatever. Modern art is basically almost the entire 20th century. Okay, so there's sub subcategories. Uh, and with the, like modern art is just this kind of umbrella term. There's all, there's, you know, Dada, there's surrealism, there's fluxus, there's pop art, there's, you know, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. It, we, you, you, you can look it up on Wikipedia too. That's what the wonderful thing about Wikipedia. You don't got to hunt uh, this stuff down in the library or, or go and, and buy a crazy expensive textbook. No, no, you can just go to Wikipedia or just Google something and you'll find all the stuff you need to know. Ab and abstract expressionism is what we're really concentrating on here. For some reason, these all of these articles that are, again, based on, probably mostly based on Saunders's work, um, they just seem to equate abstract expressionism and modern art and that like that's it that's the end of the discussion at least it seems that way to me no modern art started not even in the beginning of the 20th century like you could argue that modern art really got started um like at the end of the 19th century and but they don't talk about that they don't talk about van gogh 
they don't talk about that cad that that sleaze ball uh Paul Gauguin. Oh, I don't like him. He was he was gross. He was another Humbert Humbert, okay? Um, you know, they they don't talk about um oh, who else for goodness sake? Uh could the pre I t I talked about them recently with the Lilith painting. Could the pre-Raphaelites be classified as as modern? No, probably not. But, you know, the post-impressionists of which, you know, um Oh, Lord, Van Gogh, like he, I use the word, I use Van Gogh because everybody knows who he is. All right. That's why I, I, I'm, I'm citing him or just referencing him. Um, Van Gogh, everybody knows who Van Gogh is. He's post-impressionist and there's like the symbolist movement and all that stuff that either is, or is like the precursor to what we call modern art. Okay, and then here comes the 20th century. Here comes 1907. Here comes Pablo Picasso with um, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Okay, and that's that's supposed to be the paint, the painting, children, the painting that that was the you know if 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 modern art. Um, oh God, I'm trying to like uh, put together a cute little metaphor on the fly. You know, if Demoiselles d'Avignon was was the big ass pitcher of Kool Aid that bust in through the kitchen wall, okay, that 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 that's what <laughs> that's the status, that's the impact and effect of of Picasso's Demoiselles. It is oh yeah, the Kool Aid the Kool Aid pitcher, all right, mm. um, busted up everything allegedly. All right, they they scandalize everything in, in in the press. So maybe it wasn't you know ordinary people were just living their lives. Um, the 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 uh, intelligentsia and the and the literati. Um, that's another story altogether. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take my own little coffee break. No pumpkin spice. It's just gonna be you know straight up hazelnut creamer today. But um, you know you guys, if you haven't got your coffee stuff together. Now's your chance. I'm going to I'm going to pause and go have a couple sips of coffee and get my head together. I got some laundry to put in the dryer too. So <laughs> so um I'll be right back and I'll start reading to you. You know, maybe you could use this as a bedtime story if you have trouble sleeping. This might be the cure for your insomnia. You never know. So <laughs> I'll be right back, you guys. Hold on. <laughs> okay, you guys. I'm back. I had my little coffee. Now let's get into it. Let me let me get to reading. And I don't know. Oh, how long is this thing? Okay, the letters are not teensy weensy, but there still seems to be quite a bit of it. So I need to get get into it. Was modern art really a CIA psyop? Okay, the number of MoMA CIA Christ crossovers <clears throat> is highly suspicious, to say the least. All right. Now and they they put. The 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 patch of the central intelligence agency um it, right on top of what looks like a jackson pollock painting my god okay uh right here and i cho i chose this article because j store is supposed to be a respected like source of um academic and and uh, scholarly journals for people who are you know into that kind of thing or looking for that kind of thing but so here we go in the mid 20th century, modern art and design represented the liberalism, individualism, dynamic activity, and creative risk possible in a free society. Jackson Pollock's gestural style, for instance, drew an effective counterpoint to Nazi and then Soviet oppression. Modernism, in fact, became a weapon of the Cold War. Both the State Department and the CIA supported exhibitions of American art all over the world okay <clears throat> i i i'm just gonna go ahead and assume that they have the backup for this stuff that they they have like all of these articles well not all of them but i've read a couple that said oh you know documents reveal and they don't <clears throat> they don't link to those documents that's my only problem with this all right they say documents reveal documents reveal okay where's where's the documents i want to see them because if you write this article and you just say documents reveal um, and you don't link me to those documents, you expect me to go 
to like the CIA website and dig around in their library page or whatever. Uh Uh-uh. No, no. That's not how we do this. That's my only gripe with this. But anyway, let me continue. Uh, The preeminent cultural cold warrior Thomas W. Braden, who served as MoMA's executive secretary from 1948 to 1949, later joined the CIA in 1950 to supervise its cultural activities. Braden noted in a Saturday Evening Post article titled, I'm glad the CIA is quote-unquote immoral, that American art won more acclaim for the U.S. than uh, John Foster Dulles or Dwight W. Uh, Dwight D. D. Dwight D. Eisenhower could have bought with a hundred speeches. Okay. John Foster Dulles, eh? And Eisenhower. Oh, I got some opinions about those two. I, oh, trust and believe. But that's another video for another time. Um, <clears throat> Dwight, oh my goodness. I believe that everything that's going on in the political scene today, I'm not going to get specific because this is not that kind of channel or that kind of video, but can, it, I I believe everything we're seeing today on the world stage, so to speak, um, can be traced back to that time period of, you know, the John Fo- John Foster Dulles's and the Dwight D. Eisenhower's and, and the Richard Milhouse Nixon's. Um, and not necessarily in a bad way. I know probably most of the stuff that you've read um, talks about those those individuals in a negative light. I have a different take. But again, that's another thing for another time. Um, but yeah. Uh, the relationship between modern art and American diplomacy began during WW2, when the Museum of Modern Art was mobilized for the war effort. MoMA was founded in 1929 by Abby Aldrich Rockefeller. A decade later, her son, Nelson Rockefeller, became the president of the museum. In 1940, while he was still president of MoMA, Rockefeller was appointed the Roosevelt administration's coordinator of inter-American affairs. He also served as Roosevelt's assistant secretary of state in Latin America. Mm, Okay. The museum followed suit. MoMA fulfilled 38 government contracts for cultural materials during the Second World War and mounted 19 exhibitions of contemporary American painting for the coordinator's office, which were exhibited throughout Latin America. Well, that's interesting. Uh, This direct relationship between the avant-garde and the war effort was well suited. The term, I was I was just about to tell you the definition of avant-garde with regard to art, but here they are. Um, the term avant-garde actually began as a French military term to describe vanguard troops advancing into battle. So uh, avant means in front or before. Okay, après means after or behind. Okay. So the the avant-garde of art, whether it's art, you know, visual art or literature, it means the people that the first line of troops. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, in in the battle for hearts and minds. Oh Jesus. Okay. In the battle for hearts and minds, modern art was particularly effective. John Hay Whitney, both president of MoMA and member of the Whitney family, which founded the Whitney Museum of American Art, explained that art stood out as a line of national defense because it could, uh, quote, educate, inspire, and strengthen the hearts and wills of free men, end quote. Okay. Oh, you know I'm suspicious, but but whatever. Let's keep it moving. Whitney succeeded Rockefeller as president of the Museum of Modern Art in January 1941 so that Nelson could turn his entire attention to his coordinator duties. Under Whitney, MoMA served as a weapon of national defense. According to a museum press release dated February 28, 1941, MoMA would, quote, inaugurate a new program to speed the interchange of the art and culture of this hemisphere hemisphere among all the 21 American republics, end quote. Uh, The goal was Pan-Americanism. A traveling art caravan through Latin America would do more to bring us together as friends than 10 years of commercial and political work. Now, who who are they quoting here? Are they still quoting uh, Whitney? I don't know. Um, 
And another reason why I'm interested in this subject, uh, you know, the, the thing that the CIA is allegedly, was allegedly running a PSYOP with modern art, um, specifically abstract expressionism, is because I think it relates to our study of Kubrickology. I really do. Uh, but that's, again, another video for another time. But we need to do this before we can do that. We need to do these videos about the CIA thing in modern art before I can even attempt to uh, connect that to our Stanley and what Stanley was trying to accomplish in his in his films. Uh, but anyway, let's keep it moving. Uh, when the war ended, Nelson Rockefeller returned to the museum and his inter-American affairs staffers assumed responsibilities for MoMA's international exhibition program, René de Arnoncourt, uh, who had headed Inter-Americans Art Division, became the museum's vice president in charge of foreign activities. Fellow staffer Porter McCrae became the director of the museum's international program. Uh, modern art was so well aligned with American Cold War foreign policy that McCrae took a leave of absence from the museum in 1951 to work on the Marshall Plan. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> All righty. We could talk about the Marshall Plan some other time. But, you know, I talked about the National um, Defense Act. I think that's what it's called in 1947. Um, and then... You know, the doomsday clock and all this stuff. Who, when I was talking about Kubrick's war specifically with, uh, in, in, con in the context of Full Metal Jacket, we need to talk about the Marshall Plan too. But that's another video for another time. Um, modern art, ha 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 ha. Okay. In 1957, Whitney resigned his position as MoMA's chairman of the Board of Trustees to become United States ambassador to Great Britain. Okay, these, these people were playing on a whole nother level. I mean, this is, this is not, these are not just some, like, idle rich, you know, um, you know, the sons of, of, of the moneyed classes and whatever. No, these, I mean, they are, but, like, look at what they're doing. Look at what they're involved with. And you gotta wonder why. You got to wonder why. And that's, again, that takes us back to, you know, Nicole, Nicole Kidman's butt. All right. The, the, mm, okay. Let, let me, let me keep it moving. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Yes. Whitney remained a trustee of the museum while he was ambassador and his successor as chairman was Nelson Rockefeller, who had served as special assistant to president, president Eisenhower for foreign affairs until 1955. All right. Okay. Even though, what is this? Georgia O'Keeffe colors the landscape around a model of the CIA headquarters. Oh, shit. I've never seen this before. Have you? Wow. Okay, let's keep it moving. Even though modern art and, Amer and American diplomacy were of a piece, uh, Soviet propaganda asserted that the United States was a culturally barren capitalist wasteland to make the case for american cultural dynamism the state department in 1946 spent forty nine thousand dollars to purchase 79 paintings directly from modern art i'm sorry american modern artists and mounted them in a traveling exhibition called advancing american art oh lord the first thing that reminds me of is charles Saatchi. And the young British artist, because, but that happened in like the 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Oh, that's where he got the idea. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. I told you about Tracy Eamon and Damien Hurst and, um, you know, a bunch of them. Go ahead and look up young British artists. Um, wow. That's where he got the idea. Wow. Okay. That exhibition, which made stops in Europe and Latin America, included work from artists such as Georgia O'Keeffe and J Jacob Lawrence. Despite positive reviews from Paris to Port-au-Prince, the exhibition stopped short in Czechoslovakia in 1947 <clears throat> because Americans themselves were indignant. 
Look magazine fired off an article entitled Your Money Bought These Paintings. The Look piece questioned why U.S. tax dollars were being spent on such confusing pieces of art and wondered if these paintings... I who wrote, wait a minute, and wondered if these were paintings even art. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. This is a scandal. Okay. Uh, Harry Truman took one look at Yasuo Kuniyoshi's painting, Circus Girl Resting, which was included in the exhibit and said, if this is art, I'm a hottentot. Oh. Well, damn, Harry. I mean, your government is the one that's funding it so like why are you why are you in a snit oh dear <clears throat> okay in congress republican representatives john tabor of new york and fred busby of illinois worried that some of the artists held communist sympathies <gasps> oh dear or engaged in un-american activities i mean they did the same thing with you know julius Robert Oppenheimer, um, and that I'll get to that eventually in a video when I'm, um, you know, in connection with The Shining and the Manhattan Project and the whole thing. Um, but that's another video for another time. Uh, but anyway, the Americans' public fear, the American public's fear of the Red Menace brought advancing American art home early, but it was precisely because modern art was not university universally popular and was created by artists who openly disdained orthodoxy that it was such an effective tool in showcasing the fruits of american cultural freedom to anyone looking in from abroad okay uh president truman personally considered modern art quote merely the vaporings of half-baked lazy people end quote but he did not declare it degenerate and expel its practitioners to gulags in Siberia. Not only that, abstract expressionism in particular was a direct repudiation of Soviet socialist realism. Are you sure? Oh, really? How, where'd they get that? How'd they figure that out? Like, what made them say, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I agree with this. I really don't know if I agree with this. Um... <clears throat> Oh, Lord. Whew. That, that's another, oh my God, that is another video for another time. Nelson Rockefeller liked to call it free enterprise painting. Okay. In contrast to the Soviet Union's popular front, the New Yorker magazine wonderfully and perfectly referred to the political role of American modernism as the unpopular front. The very existence of American modern art proved to the world that its creators were free to create, whether you liked their work or not. Okay, this, this is a lot. Um, <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be so heavy. My God. If advancing American art proved the nation's artists were free because they could splatter as much pain as they wanted, it also proved that Congress could not always be induced to spend tax dollars supporting it. Braden later wrote, quote, the idea that Congress would have approved many of our projects was about as likely as the John Birch Society's approving Medicare, end quote. <laughs> okay. Uh, clearly, the State Department wasn't the right patron for modern art, which brings us to the CIA. Oh, my God. In 1947, I told you about 1947, but in 1947, at the very moment, that the Advancing American Art Show was being recalled, the United States government was selling its O'Keeffe's for 50 bucks a piece. All 79 pieces in the show together brought in $5,544. The CIA was being created. The CIA grew out of Wild Bill Donovan's Office of Strategic Services, OSS. I told you Julia Child worked for them, which was the U.S.'s wartime intelligence apparatus. MoMA's John Hay Whitney and Thomas W. Braden had both been members of the OSS. Well, fancy. Oh, <laughs> I mean, re wow. Wow. That is interesting. I love a good cup of tea. I love, uh, you know how much I love coffee, but I love a good cup of tea too. And I mean that um, metaphorically. Okay. Ooh, I love me some tea. That's tea. 
That's some tea. Anyway, their fellow operatives included the poet and librarian of Congress, Archibald MacLeish, the historian and public intellectual Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., and the Hollywood director, John Ford. By the time the CIA was codified in 1947, clandestine affairs had long been the arena of America's cultural elite. Well, shit, I told you this would tell us a little bit more about Eyes Wide Shut, but you didn't believe me, did you? Uh, <laughs> and here we are. Okay, the C oh, by the time the CIA was codified in 1947, clandestine affairs had long been the arena of America's cultural elite. Julia Child came from money, honey. Okay, Julia Child grew up in Pasadena. All right, pa I, I don't know. Those of you who are not familiar with the Southland here in, in California, Los Angeles, and and just, you know, L.A. County, um, Pasadena is money. All right. That's why when I was doing Kill Bill, I said, Verlina, move to Pasadena. Yes, yeah, she doesn't live in one of those gorgeous houses in Pasadena, but she's in Pasadena. That means she's achieved something. All right. Anyway, even to this day, like Julia Child was old as dirt when she died. Um, so in the early 20th century, Pasadena meant like serious money. It still does. In the year 2023, it still means that. Uh, for Again, for those of you who are not natives to Southern California, you kind of don't know this stuff. Um, but anyway, um, you know, and Julia Child, like if you read her biography, I love her cooking shows and I love her as a personality, but her biography has me raising my eyebrow like Jack Nicholson, you know. Um, she worked for a fashion magazine and she worked, you know, she was a spy basically uh pre for pre nineteen forty seven so she worked for the o s s like mm, and she came from serious money like okay um now as museum i'm continuing with the article now as museum staffers like Braden joined the cultural cognoscenti and the c i a fought the cultural cold war side by side with the Whitney trust acting as a funding conduit okay Speaking in front of organi oh no Lord I can't read today. Speaking of front organizations, in 1954, MoMA took over from the State Department the U.S. pavilion at the Venice Biennale, so that the U.S. could continue to exhibit modern art abroad without appropriating public funds. MoMA owned the U.S. Pavilion at Venice from 1954 to 1962. It was the only national pavilion at the show that was privately owned. Okay. Um, wow. Wow. Uh, Eisenhower made MoMA's role as a government proxy clear in 1954. Speaking at the museum's 25th anniversary celebration, Eisenhower called modern art a pillar of liberty wow saying as long as our artists are free to create with sincerity and conviction there will be healthy uh, controversy and progress in art how different it is in tyranny when artists are made the slaves and tools of the state when artists become the chief propagandists of a cause progress is arrested and creation and genius are destroyed I, it, it oh oh that i yeah yeah that shit just knocked the wind out of me i don't know about you all is this is this what they call irony help me does this belong in that Al Al alanis morissette song isn't isn't this ironic i don't know Y'all tell me in the comments. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this. But let me let me continue because I got a lot to read. Uh, it was MoMA's job concurring. Um, sh I sh ha -ha. It was MoMA's job concurred United States ambassador to the Soviet Union to demonstrate to the rest of the world both that we have a cultural life and that we care about it. Okay. The CIA not only helped finance MoMA's international exhibitions, it made cultural forays across Europe. In 1950, the agency created the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, 
headquartered in Paris, though it appeared to be an autonomous association of artists, musicians, and writers. It was, in fact, a CIA-funded project to propagate the virtues of Western democratic culture. Mm. The CCF, again, Congress of, for Cultural Freedom, operated for 17 years and, at its peak, had offices in 35 countries, employed dozens of personnel, published over 20 prestige magazines, held art exhibitions, owned a news and features service, organized high-profile international conferences, and rewarded musicians and artists with prizes and public performances. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm spe I I'm not speechless, but mm. I hope I, I hope this is giving you something to think about. And my thing is, I, I I'm reading this to you, and I love this tea. It's 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 scalding hot tea, but I still don't know what to make of this. I still don't know what to make of this. What what am I supposed to think about this? I'm at a loss, not not of, for of words, but I'm I'm at a loss for thoughts. I don't know what to think. Oh, okay. Let me keep it moving. The CIA chose to headquarter the Congress for Cultural Freedom in Paris because that city had long been the capital of European cultural life, and the CCF's main goal was to convince European intellectuals who might otherwise be swayed by Soviet propaganda, which suggested that the U.S. was home only to capitalist Philistines, that in fact that the opposite was true, with Europe weakened by war, and yeah, the 1950s were a tough time in Europe because everybody was so poor after all the bombings and things, um, the fact that the opposite was true, with Europe weakened by war, it was now the United States that would protect and nurture the Western cultural tradition in the face of Soviet dogma. I still don't know what to think. I mean, you know, I'm not really, I'm not going to render any kind of opinion here. I, I just don't know if I have um, what it takes. I'm I'm gonna have to think about this for a while. That's for sure. I'm gonna have to stare into my cup of coffee uh, for some time <laughs> and think about this. My God. Anyway, uh, Braden writing about his role in the CFF, uh, CCF. Sorry. Oh, sorry. As director of the CIA's cultural activities, explained in 1967. Uh, quote. In much of Europe in the 1950s, socialists, people who called themselves left, the very people whom many Americans thought no better than communists, were the only people who gave a damn about fighting communism, end quote. Okay. Uh, when the CIA made its bid to the European intelligentsia, the agency was waging what Braden called, quote, the battle for Picasso's mind, end quote, via Jackson Pollock's art. Okay. Accordingly, the CIA bankrolled the Partisan Review, which was the center of the American non-communist left, carrying enormous cultural prestige in both the U.S. and Europe because of its association with writers like T.S. Eliot and George Orwell. Unsurprisingly, the editor of the Partisan Review was the art critic Clement Greenberg. Oh, him. Oh, Clement. Okay. Um, the, the editor of the Partisan Review was the art critic Clement Greenberg. We need to do a video about him. Um, the most influential arbiter of taste and the strongest proponent of abstract expressionism in post-war New York. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-mm. We have much to discuss. Okay. The CFF worked with MoMA to mount 1952's uh, Masterpieces of the 20th Century Festival. Oh, shit. Wait a minute. No. Uh, in Paris. Mm. 
The works for the show came from Mama's collection and established the CCF as a major presence in European cultural life. As the historian Hugh Wilford wrote in his book, The Mighty Wurlitzer, How the CIA Played America. Okay. Uh, curator James Johnson Sweeney made sure to note that the works included in the show could not have been created by such totalitarian regimes as Nazi Germany or present-day Soviet Russia. Distilling this message even further in 1954, MoMA's August uh, Heckscher declared that the museum's work was, quote, related to the central struggle of the age, the struggle of freedom against tyranny, end quote. Okay. Um. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I don't know what to think, you guys. I don't know what to think. So, like, the, you know, again, the way, like, the culture critic dude on Twitter, they frame this. You know, I used the word frame earlier in this video. Uh, people like that, for some reason, frame this issue or discussion of this issue as they make it seem kind of like mm, these artists like a Pollock or 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 a, or a Barnett Newman or anybody like that were or a friend one of my favorites yeah favorites Franz Klein that these people were doing what they do, were doing the paintings that they were doing Pollock's uh drips and stuff like that like you see here the, the culture critic kind of people are seem to be claiming that <clears throat> those artists were doing their you know what they believe is lousy art at you know at the request of people like the cia or the moma or whatever i don't know how i feel about that um, especially Picasso is used, uh, what seems to me, as quite frequently as an example of an artist who started out great, painted normal looking stuff in the beginning of his career, and then about, you know, early 1900s, 1905, 1907, everything went to shit. And he started doing stuff like Demoiselle's Dad d'Avignon. Um, but, you know, that's way before the formation of the CIA. That's 1947. That's 40 years. Um, before the formation of the CIA and the National Security Act of, is it the National Security Act or the National Defense Act? It don't matter, but you know what I mean. The 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 thing that uh, cr actually was was what uh, led to the creation of the CIA, or that had the creation of the CIA built into it, as and the CIA is is the descendant of the uh, OSS, and the whole thing. Mmm. No, I'm not criticizing the CIA. No, I would never. Um, <laughs> I love life and I want to live. But, um, <laughs> I, you guys, I, I, I don't know what to make of this. And I'm not just trying to be a fence sitter or like ride two horses with one ass. You know, no, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just really trying to make sense of this because I've heard rumblings about this before. I sure have. I sure have. Um, I didn't know quite what to make of it. Did, I still don't. It, even after reading an article like this, this article has, has given me like, you know, it's it's leading me to ask way, 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 way more questions than I could ever have like any, I, I, I don't have any answers. This has not given me any answers. I, nothing is resolved uh, because of an article like this. I don't know how you all feel about that. Again, put it in the comments. I love reading them. I, 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 I derive great joy from reading your guys' comments. Um, what do you guys think? What in the blue fuck is going on? I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. And, you know... Um, I respect everybody's opinion, even if I don't agree with it. Sometimes, especially if I don't agree with it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I have two more articles that I wanted to show you and or possibly read you. I'm going to check to see the length of this one. Okay, that's not too much scrolling. 
um, this one. And I do want to read the what is coming from, like I said, the horse's mouth. The author of that book uh, that is called, what is it? Who Paid the Pied Piper, um, the CIA and the Cultural Cold War. And this is an English person, so the U.S. title is The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. It's a 1999 book. I want to see if there's more books of this uh, kind. Is the who is this Michael uh, Josselson? Okay, I I don't know. Do I need? Um, and like I said, chapter one, the the New York Times published chapter one. Okay, so I'm gonna read that to you in in part two of this video, but I want to do or at least skim through um, this Artnet article, which might just be a regurgitation of this JSTOR article. And I, or actually, I don't know. Okay, April 1st, wait a goddamn minute. Hold on. This thing was published April 1st, 2020. Is this a big ass joke? Is this an April Fool's joke? Wait a minute. Well, no, because this is published September 24th, 2020. So nine minus four, that's five months after this is published. Is, you know, the publishing of it on April 1st, is that just a coinky dink? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. But um, the modern art thing was, the, the you know, so before Saunders wrote her book, which was published in 1999, Obviously, she was working on it about four years earlier in 1995 in this article in The Independent that was put, it says here, 22nd of October, 1995. Okay. So, oh, I really want to read you this Saunders article. So I don't know if I, I want to do this Artnet article because it might just be, um, yeah, it was published later than the JSTOR one. So it might just be a regurgitation of the JSTOR because that's what this, that's what happens when these publications, magazines, blogs, whatever, when they when they sink their hooks into something, they all basically reproduce the same memo that they got from whoever. I don't know who. The publisher? Maybe the CIA? Shit, I don't know. Like, they all seem to write the same goddamn article with very little um, variations. So that's why, like, when I line up these tabs, I'm like, I, I find myself reading the same thing over and over and over again in a bunch of different articles so we shall see i'm I'm gonna need another coffee break but we shall see what uh, what i'll decide um or maybe i won't read it but i'll leave it for you to your homework reading um mm, homework in, in in scare quotes you guys um but let me take my little coffee break i yeah i think i'm gonna read you this one because this is the horse's mouth this is francis stoner saunders she's she's the one that seems to have written this book that caused such a such a stir made such a big splash so i'll be right back you guys i need another sip of coffee hold on okay you all i am back let me read you this article and then i'll i'll maybe maybe just skim through the Artnet article. I don't know. Anyway, modern art was CIA quote unquote weapon. Uncon revealed how the spy agency used unwitting artists such as Pollock and de Kooning in a cultural cold war. Okay, so the artists were unwitting. All right. Okay. So again, if if it doesn't make it sound like the artists were specifically manufacturing like terrible art, then it makes it sound like, you know, like it says here on Witting, that lousy artists were chosen specifically because they were lousy. I don't. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's what I'm. I'm that's that's the vibe I'm getting off of this. What say you? Please put it in the comments. But anyway, this is from Sunday, 22nd of October, 1995. So what what, what would that be? Mm -hmm, 23 and 5. So that's 28 years ago this thing was written. Okay. Now, let's see what it has to say. Uh, from the author of, again, Who Paid the Pied Piper? The Cultural Cold War. Okay. 
For decades in art circles, it was either a rumor or a joke, but now it is confirmed as a fact. The Central Intelligence Agency used American modern art, including the works of such artists as Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, Willem de Kooning, and Mark Rothko as a weapon in the Cold War, in the manner of a Renaissance prince, except that it acted secretly. The CIA fostered and promoted American abstract expressionist painting around the world for more than 20 years. Oh, oh, wait a minute. So this is, there, uh, Francis Stoner Saunders is saying that this had, this was, this had an end point that it lasted 20 years. That implies that it ended after it finished, you know, this 20 year run. Okay, let's keep it going. The connection is improbable. This was a period in the 1950s and 60s when the great majority of Americans disliked or even despised modern art. President Truman summed it up in the popular view when he said, if that's art, then I'm a Hottentot. See, we saw that quote already. Um, as for the artists themselves, many were ex-communists, barely acceptable in the America of the McCarthyite era, and certainly not the sort of people normally likely to receive U.S. government backing. Mm hmm So they say. So they say. Allegedly. I don't know what I believe yet. Uh, why did the CIA support them? Because in the propaganda war with the Soviet Union, again, that's supposed to be the purpose of all of this, the propaganda war with the Soviet Union. Oh, see, I, this is why I have trouble with this. I have problems. I, I Well, I have problems in, in, in any way. But with this, I have, I have, I have, this bothers me. This alleged propaganda war with the Soviet Union. Like, okay. Now, that, again, that, that just don't make no sense to me. Propaganda war. Propaganda war. This, this, I gotta turn that over in my head for a little while. But anyway, let me keep it going. Because in the propaganda war with the Soviet Union, this new artistic movement could be held up as proof of the creativity, the intellectual freedom, and the cultural power of the U.S. Russian art, strapped into the communist ideological straitjacket, could not compete. Are they serious? Have they ever, s have they ever seen art that was being produced by the USSR at the time? Oh, okay. The existence of this policy, and by the way, what they're talking about with the communist ideological straitjacket from Ru Russia, they don't even say the USSR, they say Russia, Soviet Union. Okay. They obviously have never heard of Ilya Yefimovich Repin. Y'all, look him up. <laughs> look him up. He's a 19th century artist, uh, died about... Uh, well, the 1920s uh, thereabouts and if you look at his biography and the biography of a lot of his contemporaries it mirrors what they're saying uh, about the art that was produced in the Soviet Union during the 50s and 60s during you know the Cold War the 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 coldest of the Cold War years okay so I, I I'm just letting you know to take a look at him and take a look at his contemporaries and read the biography and let me know what you think okay um, anyway, <laughs> yes, the existence of this policy rumored and disputed for many years has now been confirmed for the first time by former CIA officials. Again, I want to see documents. I don't give a shit what they have to say. I want to see the paper. All right. I want to see the, I want to see the documents. Anyway, unknown to the artist, unwitting dupes, um, or shall we say patsies. Anyway. Uh, if you know, you know. Unknown to the artist, the new American art was secretly promoted under a policy known as the Long Leash. Arrangements similar in some ways to the indirect CIA backing of the journal Encounter, edited by Stephen Spender. The decision to include culture and art in the U.S. Cold War arsenal was taken as soon as the CIA was founded in 1947. Oh, Stanley. Stanley, Stanley, Stanley. Uh, dismayed at the appeal communism still had for many intellectuals and artists in the West, the new agency set up a division, the Propaganda Assets Inventory, which at its peak could influence more than 
800 newspapers, magazines, and public information organizations. They joked that it was like a Wurlitzer jukebox. When the CIA pushed a button, it could hear whatever tune it wanted playing across the world. Okay. The next step came in 1950, when the International Organizations Division, IOD, was set up under Tom Braden. It was this office which subsidized the animated version of George War Orwell's Animal Farm, which sponsored American jazz artists, opera recitals, the Boston Symphony Orchestra's international touring program. Uh, its agents were placed in the film industry, in publishing houses, even as travel writers for the celebrated Fodor Guides. And we know it, provo it promoted America's anarchic avant-garde movement, abstract expressionism. Okay. I.O.D., huh? In 1950. Hmm. So George Orwell's Animal Farm. Like, we need to take a better look at George Orwell now, don't we? Animal Farm, 1984. He seems to be the best known for those. Um, Animal Farm. No, what was, jo I mean, it was George, an unwitting dupe, of the, you know, one of these artists, uh, writers in, in the field of literature, like he was just an uh, uh, unwitting dupe and or Patsy. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. And I mean, I've read some stuff, I'm per I've heard some stuff, but I take it all with a grain of salt until I have a chance to really think about it. <clears throat> but let me continue with this article. Initially, more open attempts were made to support the new American art. In 1947, the State Department organized and paid for a touring international exhibition called Advancing American Art with the, with the aim of rebutting Soviet suggestions that America was a cultural desert. But the show caused outrage at home, prompting Truman to make his Hottentot remark, and one bitter congressman to declare, I am just a dumb American who pays taxes for this kind of trash. The tour had to be canceled. The U.S. government now faced a dilemma. The Philistinism, combined with Joseph McCarthy's hysterical denunciations of all that was avant-garde or unorthodox, was deeply embarrassing. It discredited the idea that America was a sophisticated, culturally rich democracy. It also prevented the U.S. government from consolidating the shift in cultural supremacy from Paris to New York since the 1930s. To resolve this dilemma, the CIA was brought in. This connection was not quite as odd as it might appear. At this time, the new agency, staffed mainly by Yale and Harvard graduates, many of whom collected art and wrote novels in their spare time, like I said, the idle rich, uh, was a haven of liberalism when compared with a political world dominated by McCarthy or with J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. If any official institution was in a position to celebrate the collection of Leninists, Trotskyites, and heavy drinkers that made up the New York school, it was the CIA. Until now, there has been no first-hand evidence to prove that this connection was made. Uh, but for the first time, a former case officer, Donald Jameson, has broken his silence. Oh, now I gotta look at him too. Jesus. Okay. Yes, he says. The agency saw abstract expressionism as an opportunity, and yes, it ran with it. Regarding abstract expressionism, I guess this is a quote from Jameson, uh, quote, regarding abstract expressionism, I'd love to be able to say that the CIA invented it just to see what happens in New York and downtown Soho tomorrow, he joked, end quote. Uh, and here's another quote. But I think that what we did really was to recognize the difference. It was recognized that abstract expressionism uh, was the kind of art that made socialist realism look even more stylized and more rigid and confined than it was. And that relationship was exploited in some of the exhibitions. Uh, he continues, In a way, our understanding was helped because Moscow in those days was very vicious in its denunciation of any kind of nonconformity to its own very rigid patterns. And so one could quite adequately and accurately reason that anything they criticized that much and that heavy-handedly was worth support one way or another. I see I'm having trouble with this. And 
again my guts are bubbling i don't know like what part of it i have trouble with i just know something's wrong with these statements i told you my guts are boiling i don't i i oh this don't make no sense none but let me continue uh, to pursue its underground interest in Americans' lefty avant-garde, the CIA had to be sure its patronage could not be discovered. Oh, okay. Uh, matters of this sort could only have been done in two or three removes, Mr. Jameson explained, so that there wouldn't be any questioning of having to clear Jackson Pollock, for example, or do anything that would involve these people in the organization and it couldn't have been any closer because most of them were people who had very little respect for the government in particular and certainly none for the cia mm -hmm. i'm gonna have to take a look at jackson pollock's biography see whether or not this is true or you know it, or whether or not it could be a lie i don't know if you had to use people who considered themselves one way or another to be closer to moscow than to washington well so much the better perhaps what the hell something isn't making sense to me it it does seem like okay a lot of these people from that time period like the 40s 50s 60s these avant-garde uh, let's just call them that artists and writers and they a lot of them seem to be heavy 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 drinkers is that just because like they had circumstances in their lives that drove them to drink or is it the fact like i'm thinking maybe they knew it says here the you know their long leash policy they didn't know allegedly that they were there them and their art were being used for this kind of shit but you know the levels of alcoholism and substance abuse and just horribleness with with regard to their personal lives leads me to think that pe these people did know that their art was being used for this kind of shit and maybe it just depressed them very very deeply and they cracked open a bottle of gin or you know um to to cope because like you know they they maybe realized that their whole lives and their whole career as artists were that that was that was all just a colossal lie i mean if you knew if you knew that about yourself like if you had success and you were getting paid good money and getting all of this um fame and notoriety and press and and you were a success in your career as an artist but at the same time you knew it was all a huge a huge gargantuan sham like that might just depress you that might just make you a little bit cynical and maybe even despise your own fame because it's not really you know it's it's it, it, if that if what if if any of this is like accurate if this person what's his face jameson um uh if if he's telling the truth which i doubt i don't believe this person all the way no but if he's t telling the truth about this and the way they use these people, these artists, these unwitting dupes, um, patsies, if you will, um, like, that's terrible. That's terrible. Throwing money at somebody and saying, you know, your art is lousy, but we're using it to uh, wage this propaganda war and we want like the ugliest shit we can find that's why we chose you and your art um that i i don't know how do you guys think like you would feel if somebody said that to you if somebody threw a bunch of money at you and you could buy a nice house and a nice car and eat good and and whatever and be the toast of the town and and be in the papers and tv and whatever but you knew it was all a huge lie and that no you know the people who are sponsoring you uh don't really think that you're a good artist no they actually think you're a bad artist and that's why they chose you like would would, would have, that have an effect on you emotionally tell me i want to know in the comments 
Um, anyway, let me, let me keep it moving. Uh, this was the long leash. The centerpiece of the CIA campaign became, uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, a vast jamboree of intellectuals, writers, historians, poets, and artists, which was set up with CIA funds in 1950 and run by a CIA agent. It was the beachhead wi from which culture could be defended against the attacks of Moscow and its fellow travelers in the West. At its height, it had offices in 35 countries and published more than two dozen magazines, including Encounter. The Congress for Cultural Freedom also gave the CIA the ideal front to promote its covert interest in abstract expressionism. This all seems to be centered around abstract expressionism. Okay. And there seems to be a renewed interest in abstract expressionism and not just abstract expressionism, but its role in this shit. Then maybe that's why it's been like such a frequent like search term lately. I don't know. It would be uh, the official sponsor of touring exhibitions. Its magazines would provide useful platforms for critics favorable to the new American painting. And no one, the artists included, would be any the wiser. Would no one? Yeah, like everybody's blind and stupid, right? Okay. Um, again, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. That's that's what they were up to. They, this organization put together several exhibitions of abstract expressionism during the 1950s. One of the most significant, the New American Painting, visited every big European city in 1958 through 59. Other influential shows included Modern Art in the United States, 1955, and Masterpieces of the 20th Century, 1952. Because abstract expressionism was expensive to move around and exhibit, millionaires and museums were uh, millionaires and museums were called into play. Preeminent among these was Nelson Rockefeller, whose mother had co-founded the Museum of Modern Art in New York. As president of what he called Mummy's Museum, Rockefeller was one of the biggest backers of abstract expressionism, which he called free enterprise painting. His museum was contracted to the Congress for Cultural Freedom to organize and curate most of its important art shows. Okay. The museum was also linked to the CIA by several other bridges. William Paley, the president of CBS Broadcasting and the founding father of the CIA, Oh, Lord. Oh, see, we're learning all kinds of things today. Uh, anyway, William Paley sat on the members' board of the museum's international program. John Hay Whitney, who had served in the agency's wartime predecessor, the OSS, was its chairman. And Tom Braden, first chief of the CIA's International Organizations Division, was ex executive secretary of the museum in 1949. N now in his 80s, Mr. Braden lives in Woodbridge, Virginia, in a house packed with abstract expressionist works and guarded by enormous Alsatians. He explained the purpose of the IOD. Uh, here's the quote. We wanted to unite all the people who were writers, who were musicians, who were artists, to demonstrate that the West and the United States was devoted to freedom of expression and to intellectual achievement without any rigid barriers as to what you must write and what you must say and what you must do and what you must paint, which was what was going on in the Soviet Union. Ugh, listen, maybe they didn't tell these people what they must paint and write and do, but by choosing a certain set of artists who all seem to be doing something very similar, they were effectively saying that. I mean, who who is this guy kidding? Anyway, let me let me keep it moving. Um, which was what was going on in the Soviet Union. I think it was the most important division that the agency had, and I think that it played an enormous role in the Cold War. Mm. <sighs> I still have questions. Okay. He confirmed that his division had acted secretly because of the public hostility to the avant-garde. 
It was very difficult to get Congress to go along with some of the things we wanted to do. Send art abroad, send symphonies abroad, publish magazines abroad. That's one of the reasons it had to be done covertly. It had to be secret. In order to encourage openness, we had to be secret. What the f Lord! Did you all hear that? It had to be secret. It had to be done covertly. Convert covertly, sorry. In order to encourage openness, we had to be secret. Do, isn't that what they call a paradox? Oh, Lord. I don't know what to think anymore. Like, this is turning into a comedy. Isn't it? It. it this is, this is, this is, this is, this is to laugh. In order to encourage openness, we had to be secret. The nerve. The audacity. And they say shit like this out loud. In a place where people can hear them. And then it ends up in print like this. And they don't expect anybody. Anybody. To take a statement like this. In order to encourage openness, we had to be, we had to be secret. They don't expect anybody to take a statement like that and say, wait a minute, mm -mm, something's wrong with that. That don't make no sense. You <laughs> Encouraging openness by being secret. Oh my God. Oh my. You know what they say though? Like what, what's that saying? Um, sometimes the big secret is that there is no secret. Possibly. I don't know. But anyway, let me let me keep it moving. If this meant playing Pope to this playing Pope, eh? Oh, okay. If this meant playing Pope to this century's Michelangelo as well, at the be all the better. It takes a Pope or somebody with a lot of money to recognize art and to support it, Mr. Braden said. Aft and after many centuries, people say, oh, look, the Sistine Chapel, the most beautiful creation on earth. It's a problem that civilization has faced ever since the first artist and the first millionaire or pope who supported him. And yet, if it hadn't been for the multimillionaires or the popes, we wouldn't have had the art. Now, this is true. <laughs> this is true. This is true. That's why I don't understand the people who hate modern art but love something like this example like the sistine chapel or or anything by michelangelo or anything by leonardo da vinci they love that and they say oh no that's real art that's that's the, that's the real shit but like this 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 fucking trash in the 20th century oh no fuck that shit you know that's that's horrible that's garbage wait just because Michelangelo and Leonardo are quote-unquote beautiful, or what we've been taught is beautiful, it doesn't mean that they weren't doing the same thing, or they weren't being used. Okay, now this Braden per is it Braden? Yeah, Braden. This Braden person is pointing out actually something very interesting. It doesn't mean that Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, the, the Ninja Turtles, that they weren't, and others, their contemporaries, that they weren't being used in exactly the same way that Pollock and de Kooning and whoever else, Barnett Newman and, and, and Klein and all of them, and the, the, all the rest of them, doesn't mean that those guys, that the Ninja Turtles, weren't being used the same way as these abstract expressionists. It's just a different look. But the purpose was the same. That's why I'm so highly critical of Renaissance art and things that we've been taught to believe or just automatically recognize or acknowledge as good art. Um, you know, th th I, that's why I question it. That's why I'm skeptical about that shit, too. That was propaganda, too. The Sistine Chapel. The, you know, uh, Santa Maria della Grazie, that's where the, the Last Supper is located in Milan. Um, you know, the Isenheim altarpiece, that's another famous religious work. Um, those are propaganda pieces. Just like this, this, you know, stuff by Pollock de Kooning, etc., etc., 
Picasso, whoever, Andy Warhol, whoever, whoever, those big names that are basically synonymous with the word art in the 20th century. Those are the Michelangelo's and Leonardo's and Donatello's and Raphael's of the 20th century in the world of art. And they were chosen and used, exploited, for more or less the same reason. That's my argument. That's what I think. Okay, Andy Warhol was painting pictures of dollar signs for a reason. Gershom, if you're listening. Um, Andy Warhol was painting pictures of dollar signs and screen pe screen printing like uh, repetitions of Marilyn Monroe's face in color in black and white and in those garish pastels uh, for a reason. Andy Warhol was making those Brillo boxes and soup cans for a reason. Like, you know, just because a person is chosen um you know maybe maybe jackson jackson pollock and a lot of his peers turn to drink people like andy warhol say fuck you and you know let me let me do a box of uh a, you know a, a wooden block that's painted to look like a cardboard box that's used for transporting uh mass-produced material usually foodstuffs like soup or ketchup or, or whatever andy warhol said fuck you to everybody and you know there are other artists who, who do this salvador dali might have been one of them andy warhol who else um it's difficult to like determine you have to look at the individual artist's art and like think about it for a second and that's why what i'm trying to teach you on this channel good children my pupils like what i'm trying to teach you is how to tell the difference how to tell the difference between an artist who's using you you know using fire to fight fire fighting fire with fire and like a jackass i believe it is possible to tell the difference sometimes it's extremely difficult sometimes it's extremely difficult to um, tell the difference between just a, a common uh, propagandist and somebody like a stanley kubrick or an andy warhol or a salvador dali or i, I maybe i should do a video about jonathan meese y'all let me know if you even know who that is Ooh, but he's he's really quite something um a lot of these artists actually did go to art school like andy warhol and and so, uh, salvador dali i can't think of a better draftsman than salvador dali like just look at his paintings or look at his drawings if you can find them online um he was immensely talented he was very good at performing mimesis and so was again a lot of these guys um you know, that's supposed to be the measure for artistic talent when you have nothing else, whether or not they can make a drawing of something look like the real thing. Mimesis. Um, but they took that, that gift, and they did something different with it. Okay. Now, th this is all what I'm talking about. This little tangent is for another video for another time. But that's what I'm kind of trying to teach you. And myself, not just you, but my, I'm, I'm, I'm a student too. At the same time, uh, how can you separate the wheat from the chaff, or chaff, or however it's pronounced? Like what? How do you know? It's not easy. It's not easy. It's like Beatrix Kiddo in Kill Bill fighting those crazy eighty-eights, those bureaucrats those possible representatives of of something like nazism uh she she fights them there's so many of them and she has to slice through them and they all want to kill her and um and in and, and one portion of that scene in, in volume one that i just did a video about she has to fight them in the dark you know that's very dramatic but it's kind of what you have to do in this world to make sense of it so many things have been created specifically for the purpose of deceiving you and parting you with your money. They think you're a fool, you know? Um, 
So that's why it's good to look at this kind of stuff every now and again. Right? I know Stanley did it. I know David Lynch did it. I know. I know. And and probably Alfred Hitchcock too. Um I should I should analyze some Hitchcock films, shouldn't I? Ooh, okay, hold on. Let me get let me get through this first. Anyway, um it, like what he says here, last line of this paragraph, and yet, if it hadn't been for the multimillionaires or the popes, he's equating those two, we wouldn't have had the art. Is true. <laughs> it's not about who painted the thing. It's about who paid for it. Who's the sponsor? Or like, you know, the thing on Instagram or social media in general, hashtag um, tag the sponsor. If you don't know what that is, look it up. You, you'll you get a good laugh, I promise you. Um, would abstract expressionism have been the dominant art movement of the post-war years without this patronage? The answer is prob prob probably. The answer is probably yes, according to Francis Stoner Saunders. Equally, it would be wrong to suggest that when you look at at an abstract expressionist painting you are being duped by the cia wait a minute francis oh lord she's trying to she's trying to ride two horses with one ass she say what is she saying it's bad but it's not that bad she's saying that like what the cia was doing i mean is she even assigning any kind of like ethical value to it i don't know but she's um she's saying okay if it is bad is really not that bad because these were not bad artists really francis okay francis all right two ho two horses one ass oh that sounds terrible okay never mind um but look at where this art ended up in the marble halls of banks in airports and city halls boardrooms and great galleries for the cold warriors who promoted them these paintings were a logo a signature for their culture and system, which they wanted to display everywhere that counted. They succeeded. Mm. Okay. Uh, the full story of the CIA and modern art is told in Hidden Hands on Channel 4. Next, Well, this is back in 1995. Uh, this, the first program in the series is screened tonight. <gasps> oh, I wonder if I can find this on YouTube. Francis Stoner Saunders is writing a book on the cultural Cold War. Well, damn, I'm going to have to keep an eye out for this. Hidden hands. Well, 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 well. Okay. Hidden hands, though. A covert operation. How much more of this is? Okay, this is the last little bit. Covert operation. In 1958, the touring exhibition The New American Painting included works by Pollock, de Kooning, Motherwell, and others, was on show in Paris. The Tate Gallery was keen to have it next, but could not afford to bring it over. Late in the day, an American millionaire and art lover, Julius Fleshman, stepped in with the cash, and the show was brought to London. Now, I'm wondering if this Fleshman is like the yeast people, because there's like a brand in, in the United States of yeast that's made to, you know, that, that's that's uh, meant for use in bread and, and other um, kind of baked goods. Is that the Fleshman? I don't know. The money that Fleshman provided, however, was not his, but the CIA's. And where, I want to, they, they never talk about where the CIA gets its money. Oh, okay. It came through a body called <clears throat> the Fairfield, oh no, no, I'm sorry, the Farfield Foundation, uh, of which Fleshman was president. Okay. All right. Uh, but far from being a millionaire's charitable arm, the foundation was a secret conduit for CIA funds. Again, where does the CIA get its money? Nobody ever talks about that. I don't expect to find an answer, but I mean, aren't you curious? I know I am. Anyway, so unknown to the Tate, the public or the artist, the exhibition was transferred to London at American taxpayers. Oh, it comes from the taxpayers now, does it? Okay. Uh, okay. Transferred to London at American taxpayers as expense to serve subtle Cold War propaganda purposes. 
I still don't understand how pri- well, you know what? I said I I I I almost said I still don't understand how promoting modern art, abstract expressionism, whatever, is really like an effective tool of propaganda. I just don't know. I'm going to have to think about it. Maybe you all can tell me in the comments. Anyway, a former CIA man, Tom Braden, described how such conduits as the Fairfield Foundation were set up. We would go to somebody in New York who was a well-known rich person, and we would say, we want to set up a foundation. We would tell him what we were trying to do and pledge him to secrecy. And he would say, of course I'll do it. And then you would publish a letterhead and his name would be on it and there would be a foundation. It was really a pretty simple device. Oh my God. Julius Fleshman was well placed for such a role. He sat on the board of the International Program of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as did several powerful figures close to the CIA. What in the blue? I've, I've said that several times during this video. Um, I just don't know what to think. Oh. What? Okay, so we have a couple of commenters down there, allegedly five days ago, even though this thing was written in 95. Um, ooh, so the CIA was involved in helping communists destroy the U.S. Let, well, I don't know. This person, like, did they read the article? Because apparently this was supposed to fight the communists. I, I don't I don't know. Uh, congressional record. Oh, wait a minute. Communist? I don't know. Ay, ay, ay. Where are they getting this? This this Congressional Record Appendix, page A34 through A35, January 10th, 1963. The Communist Goals. And they put a, um, a website link. I don't know. Then this, this commenter, Sir Galahad, says, Plausible deniability. Put it down to the Cold War. It's kind of believable, but I'm skeptical. I think it's just a part of the war on culture and Western civilization. The primary enemy of the CIA is always the American people. See, I'm not totally on board with this either. Because, okay, they, the, this sentence, the primary enemy of the CIA is always the American people. Like, nobody ever explains that statement. How? Why? Do they assume? that the CIA is trying to destroy America. Like, aren't they an American agency? But again, I, I have many questions. Many. I'm not saying that this is good. Oh, no. And I just don't like deception of any kind. Uh, only to save lives. That's the only time that I'll, 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 I'm okay with, with um, any kind of deception or, or anything like that. But this thing, this this issue with regard to what I've been reading to you about uh, modern art was CIA weapon revealed how the spy agency used unwitting artists such as Pollock and de Kooning in a cultural cold war. This looks like they're like just blowing the lid off of everything now, doesn't it? But not really. There's plenty they're not telling us here. And you can't even, like, figure it out by reading between the lines. Because, again, uh, once again, this don't make a no sense. This is a grilled cheese sandwich I'm going to have to turn over and over and over in my head. It's going to get burnt. Uh, but I'll eat it anyway. But I need to, <laughs> I need to do this. I need to, like, think about this and try to figure this out. I mean, again, I suggest that you all try to, because this is not going to be easy. This is going to be, like, whew. This is this is going to be like a group effort, or it needs to be. Again, you guys get in those comments and let me know what you think. Now, this Artnet article, I don't have time for this. I've already been talking at you for an hour and 43 minutes, so I definitely don't have time for this. So I don't know if I should strike this from the article list in the description or what. Or maybe I'll just leave it for you. doesn't matter. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed your bedtime story or, you know, or your coffee, um, 
listening i easy listening for for um devotees of caffeine now you guys i've been tinkering and toying with these um oh good another subscriber 9 30 so i'm up to 9 30 now you guys uh thank you so much i appreciate it so much and now i said i've been saying like when i put the word hose in a title that means that my video is going to do better not necessarily i have noticed i with this latest eyes wide shut part three i put the word hose didn't do much and then i messed with the title and i turned the title into a question okay so eyes wide shut part three why did stanley kubrick choose a book about sex and hose question mark okay it's got to be a question. Now, I'm if I learn something, you're going to learn it too. This is a learning journey for me, this whole YouTube nonsense. So I think I figured it, another little thing out. I haven't figured it all out, but just this one little thing. If you're doing your titles, try to turn it into a question. Use a question mark and possibly use like hot button words like hose or sex or nudity or drugs or whatever. Whatever you think is going to bring the viewers. I don't know. Um... So there's that. So it's not just hose. It's got to be hose and a question mark. Okay, we got to be questioning the hose. <laughs> All right. So you guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to have to figure out what to title this thing. That includes the word hose and, you know, framing it. Hello. Hello. Framing it as a question. But you all know what I'm doing. I'm not peddling filth. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. No. <laughs> it's the same uh programming you you you've become accustomed to so anyway you all thank you so much i hope you enjoyed your coffee i know i did um returning viewers thank you for returning new viewers thank you for being new subscribers thank you so much for subscribing i appreciate every single last one of you so much even the last one like it was 9:29 when i started the video now it's 9:30 i am 70 uh, subscribers away from 1000 and you know then ergo being monetized let's let's do it help me help me get my little two dollars a month from youtube um i'll go out and buy a stick of gum i don't know with my first paycheck but um you know, thank you for being here. I appreciate you all so much. Did I say don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share? Well, if I didn't, now I did. And especially, again, emphasis on liking, emphasis on um, hit that notification bell so you can always get uh, notifications whenever I drop a new video. And emphasis on commenting. I can't wait to see what you guys have to say about this subject. Oh, my God. Um you know tell me what you think tell me like you know do you see gaps do you see um just th you know things that just don't make sense do you see things about this story as it's told to the again it you know what sorry i had a little interruption but um tell me what part of this doesn't make sense to you or maybe you don't feel that way maybe you think it makes perfect sense i don't know i mean i can see why this is such a popular topic in you know posts and and social media stuff and whatever lately but at the same time i just cannot i just cannot i'm I, i'm one of those people i just cannot unquestioningly accept the the official version of any story i know that there are parts of it of, of it that are missing i know that there's some i know there's something missing i know that's why i'm having trouble but y'all let me know in the comments i can't wait so once again thank you for watching i hope y'all are doing awesome i hope you're enjoying the coffee and life in general so until next time what am i going to do next time well i don't know wait shit Hold on. <laughs> what am I going to do next time? Um, Kill Bill, FMJ, Eyes Wide Shut. Did I say I would do an FMJ? Let me do an FMJ. Let me do an FMJ next time. And then I'll get back into this um, CIA nonsense. Um, because I believe they're connected. Okay.
Full Metal Jacket in 1947 and the whole thing. So there he is with his war face, Joker. And oh, look, look, oh, look at this right next to Jack with his mouth like gaping wide open to, ooh, Stanley, you did it again. And anyway, you guys, um, yeah, that's what I'll do. FMJ next time, then continue with the CIA. Then get back into The Shining, understanding The Shining, my frame-by-frame -frame analysis. So that's what you should expect for the next episode of my nonsense. So until next time, you guys, until next time, when I find yet another reason to talk at you in one of these videos, I'm going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So bye-bye, everybody.